praise the Lord for that. Just one of those, I don't know if it applies to anybody else, but there's times when there's certain songs that I sing and it, and it, and it takes me back a little bit. And um, especially how I was raised, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about that today. I've got some um, specific um, stories that I'm going to share about my childhood and the way that I was raised and how it applies to the story today. So let's get into the scripture this morning. Let's turn to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, there's some back here. Diane can uh, hand some of those out if you want one. If you want one, just raise your hand. Forgive for those online forgivers. Maybe she walks in front of the camera or something, but um, that happens from time to time. Welcome to G3 Community Church. This is the way that we do it. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Scripture's a little lengthy this morning, but I'm going to encourage you to really get the, the story we're going to talk about today isn't about Ruth, it's about Naomi. But as we get into the scripture, I would just encourage you this week, it actually won't take you a lot of time. Go read the whole book of Ruth this week. Just get into it. And uh, yeah, only four chapters. And, and it's um, just just a great recording. And I think it, it comes timely. I'll just lay this right out there. For those that are online and may watch it later. And um, there is great application, use, and purpose. I guess I just feel the need to say this publicly. There's a lot of talk right now um, in certain circles about the place for women in ministry. And I want to let you know that it is obvious that God uses women all the time. It's important that we know that. It's important that we embrace this and we understand this and that it's not a um, some sort of second-class role. Um, it, it's, it's sad that there's actually folks that argue about it. And it just, I don't think the argument needs to be there. Uh, there's different roles that we all have and there's different things that we all do. But at the end of the day, um, these in this series, in this uh, Mothers We Should Know, they're incredible recordings right in the Word of God. And so I'm excited to dive, dive into this today. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were, now get ready for this. You guys are going to be thankful for your names today. Uh, Mahlon and Chilean is the best way that I know to describe that. I've looked up several different ways, and there's several different pronunciations. They were... Um, uh, Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took these two uh, these two sons took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. If you read it too fast, you'll think Oprah, but it's Orpah, and the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years. Both. Milan and Chilean died so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard that in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying 
No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, and her gods return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and to more also, if anything, but departs from me, if anything but depart, but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Again, a little bit of homework this week. Read all of Ruth. Let's have a word of prayer as we've read God's word. Heavenly Father, we ask you to take your word. God, I understand your word's enough. But God, allow me to communicate what's on my heart and mind tonight, today about Naomi and what you would have laid on the hearts of the people that are here in my home, watching online and in the other groups. God, we thank you for this. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, mothers, you should know, we're in our third week and we're going to deal with with five mothers. We'll deal with another one next week and I'll share a couple of announcements at the end here about next week, which is Go Week, and the following week, which is a fifth Sunday coming up in May. But today, let me let me share with you some, some commentary, if I could, about Naomi and summarize here what's happened. And as you read through Ruth this week, again, homework assignment, as you read through it, there's some things that you'll learn. Naomi and her family fled to the country of Moab because of famine in their land. We read about that. Her husband died and her two sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. So here they are. I mean, times are tough, to say the very least. And uh, there's a lot of dependency here. After 10 years, both of Naomi's sons passed away. Uh, and Naomi heard that the Lord had blessed the land of the people with food again. And, you know, thus the story that we talked about just a little bit ago. It's like, it's okay, it's time to return. But as they're returning, she's like, no, you, you go back to your mom's house and you go back to your mom's house. And it wasn't an idea that Naomi's like, I've had enough of you guys, I'm done. It was really from the understanding of um, go into park, go back to your homes, and, and, be, and be blessed. Start a new life, you know. Naomi wasn't tired of them. She was just like, be, begin a new life. But then Ruth was already learning from Naomi's faith, and I'm sure, I'm sure Orpah did as well. So, But we learn about Ruth here, and Ruth was already learning from Naomi's faith even during a time of great bitterness. Imagine the bitterness that this family was going through, had been through, the reminders. Naomi continued to watch out for Ruth and instruct her wisely in her dealings with Boaz, who will be introduced as you read through Ruth this week, who became her kinsman redeemer. Now, I'll encourage you. I did. I'm not going to go into it because I don't have all the time that we could. When you go and you Google and look up and get into different commentaries on kinsman redeemer, it's actually pretty cool stuff. Okay, The way that families and friends and people that were close took care of one another is extraordinary. It, it, it truly is. The Lord blessed Naomi and she gained a son when Boaz married Ruth. So here's Boaz playing a role. Uh, now, it's a, it's, there's also this, this whole delay in Boaz and Ruth getting married, but they do. And Ruth um, and Boaz had a child and the woman of the land said to Naomi, the, the women of the land said to Naomi this, Praise be to the Lord who has this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, is bet, who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. The child was named Obed, who is the father of Jesse, who is the father of King David. Because of the faithfulness and the teaching of Naomi and teaching Ruth and Ruth's faithfulness and sticking some things out and going through all this bitterness, there is great reward, even re reward that, you know, Naomi may not have even seen all of it. You know, and here's the lineage. Now we're talking about King David, and many of you know the story of that. Read the whole book of Ruth. It is incredible what unfolds 
And because of faithfulness, what happens because of this mother, Naomi? Well, I, I want to share with you that this is not a, in any way, um, oh, this is great. My slides didn't download today. That's okay. <laughs> no slides. You get to stare at this the whole time. For whatever reason, they didn't download. I can try to do it, but I'm afraid it would cut our um, our um, our feed off. Thank you, Jim. So if you're taking notes today, the first thing that I want to share with you, and this is going to be a very simple outline, and on the surface, if I were just to share the outline, you'd be like, well, that was kind of a duh today, Doug. I mean, you know, you know, no kidding. We know we're supposed to do that. But I'm going to share with you an outline. I'm going to illustrate for you about Naomi and how this applies to our lives and what we need to do walking out of here. If there's anything that I really try hard to do in, in when we gather in groups and we meet together and we have worship is one, make sure you have an opportunity to be introduced to Jesus. Number two is that there's something that I unpack for you that, and number three, not only that you can unpack, but number three is that you can use throughout the week. So I'm hoping that you can do this. Number one is have faith in God. You're like, well, thank you for that enlightenment, Pastor Doug. That was awesome that we need to have faith in God. But throughout the book of Ruth, and again, I hope you'll read it this week, you'll see the incredible faith that Ruth had in God. And it wasn't, even though she trusted Naomi and she wanted to learn from her, her faith was in God, as was Naomi, so no question about it. But we learn about this, and she's an incredible mother because of her incredible faith. Well, this didn't just happen. What happens here in having our faith in God is that we need to understand that we must be grounded with God. And here's where I see things start to disconnect. Diane and I have, have met with um, some folks this week. And you have to ask the question, are you grounded with the Lord? Where is your relationship with God? But when you look at it, there are times. Now, I'll leave room for the fact that if I were to talk to Brother Jim and to say, where is your relationship with the Lord? Maybe I don't spend a lot of time with Brother Jim. And I would say, I just don't see it, Jim. Well, I'm not with him all the time. So maybe there's a relationship and evidence of this relationship that I don't see. But there was evidence of her relationship with the Lord that Naomi had, that Ruth saw, and then it continued and was passed on down to Ruth. There's a relationship. They were grounded with the Lord, dependent upon the Lord, no question about it, and there was evidence of that. But in meeting with some folks and, and counseling with some folks, and I will tell you that I, I really understand the reason now. The people who come to groups and come to church and get fed and watch online and take it all in need less than those who don't. The reason is they're not grounded. You, you'll ask people, when's the last time you, you read the Word of God? Well, no, I, I read the Bible. No, did, no, when is the last time that you spent, you know, when did you get into that habit? When's the last time you prayed? And of course, the answer is always, well, I, I, I probably pray every day. Really? So like you have this conversation with God, but people who truly do get into the word, pray with God, grounded with God, and have this connection with the Lord and dependent upon him, do you know that there's life's better? There, there, there aren't fewer conflicts. You know how to deal with them. You know how to battle them through this relationship with God. So there's this you have to be grounded with God. So having faith in God includes a relationship, in my, in my humble opinion. But you must be grounded also in the Word of God. And that isn't just reading a Bible verse or having a couple memorized. When I say grounded in the Word of God, I really think scripture, scripture memorization is of critical importance. Don't get me wrong. But let me set that aside for just a moment. You've got to read and get into the Word of God. You've got to be grounded with God through relationship. You've got to be grounded with the Word of God and understand the Word of God and get into it and read it each day. That's what I call the education portion or discipleship, if you would. It's a journey. It's a path. You've got to get into the Word of God. I can't tell you the number of times where I will just be searching through Scripture and I'll read something and either, either it will have applied to something I just went through in that day or it applies to something that I know is going to happen in the next day or two. You just have to be grounded in your relationship with God, but you got to be grounded in your education or in the Word of God. You have to do that in order to have this faith in God. But the third part of this have faith in God 
I, I believe this with my whole heart, and I don't want to apologize for this, and I'm going to be pretty straightforward with it. You have to be grounded with God through other people. I don't think that you can have a strong faith in God and not have a relationship with him, be educated and study his word, and not have fellowship with other believers. You gain such strength from it. I mean, I don't want to puff the students up too much, but I gain strength in my relationship with God because I spend time with the students on Wednesday night. I gain strength with my relationship with God because I hear what you guys have to say and we feed back here in a few minutes and we have some facilitator questions and, I, and my strength grows. My strength grows because we'll share prayer requests here in a little bit and we hear these things and we have fellowship with one another and, and, and I'll hear things like, and, and Diane will share prayer requests and the Brossies will and all of us will and we'll share these things and our faith grows because we see, you know what, we're not alone in all these things that we're going through. I mean, the whole saying misery loves company, life's hard. But when you know you have people that you can depend upon, and I look at Ruth to Naomi, and I look at this fellowship and go, they, they, were, they were legally a family. But upon that death, there's a connection that remained. And Ruth was close to God, there's no question, but there was a fellowship that she had with Naomi and said, I don't want to let you go. I want to continue to have fellowship. You're a believer. You are teaching me. You're training me. And that's the relationship we're to have with one another. I actually see people try to escape these type of relationships because there's a degree of accountability with it. People get to know you. But you have to have faith in God. Number two is you have to show your faith to others. Boy, did Naomi do this just huge. The evidence is there. I'm not sure when this began or why, but somewhere in time there's been a shift in when, where, and how we show our faith. And when I say show our faith to others, somehow humility became blended with secrecy and Christians camouflage their faith. Let me see if I can explain that. In the New Testament, not just the disciples, but the early church really lived their faith out loud. I mean, you knew these are believers, these are not. These folks believe in Jesus Christ. It was an outward display, and it wasn't an arrogant outward display. It was just people knew that you were a person of faith. And somehow we've become very, um, I don't know if we would call it discreet or confidential, shy, whatever the word is, but it, we're not as... We're not trained well in showing that we're believers. Let me see if I can explain that a little bit better. Holiness and being separate from the rest of the world has somehow become uncool even in church. We blame this on that we want to be attractional. We want to appear to be, you know, blended, if you will. Um, and really lifestyle evangelism, and I'm not going to contradict myself. I want you to understand that there's a there's a combination. But blending with only lifestyle evangelism became the standard because the gospel can be offensive. So what we decided to do is that we decided that let's adopt this lifestyle evangelism that we're just going to, we're going to act like we're Christians most of the time, but I don't want the world to really tell a difference. We want to blend in. And this lifestyle evangelism really became the standard because we didn't want the gospel to be too offensive to people. And that's the nature of the... And by the way, this was a shift decades ago. Decades and decades ago, not something recently. But if you want something offensive now to people, share the gospel. We'll get to that in a minute. But I see a, a lifestyle change, if you will. Naomi showed her family that God was first by the things that she did, not just the things that she said. Naomi showed her family and friends that her relationship with God came before anything else. We need to get back to placing God before everything else in our lives. That we show people that God is first. And let me, I'm going to use this family illustration if I could. Um, um, no, no offense to my mom. I would say this if she were alive and here today. 
And she would agree with me that our Naomi was my dad. Okay, now understand Naomi's family, that was not there. Naomi's a mother, we should all know, and we should all have Naomi's in our life. My Naomi was my dad. Um, my dad showed me, he did not have to tell me, God come, God would come before his wife. I was, I would watch my dad go to church without my mom. Now that wasn't much. It was typically Sunday nights. My mom didn't want to go. It was typically Thursday night visitation, Wednesday night Bible study. There were times, mom went 90% of the time, but there were times when it didn't deter my dad when mom said, I don't feel like going. Dad would be like, okay, I'll be back in about an hour and a half or whenever it was. My dad showed us kids that God came before even that relationship, and he should. The second thing that my dad showed me was that God comes before family. We went to church, period. We went. Even if one of us was sick, he would tell us to throw up and prove it. But the second thing was, is that even if one of us was sick, the rest of us would all go. Be like, well, good luck with that. We're going to church. Um... And it wasn't in an arrogant way. If you guys, if you ever had met my dad, he didn't have an arrogant bone in his body, but he did show us that God came before his wife, God came before his family, and he, he went to church, period. And we were all going as well. He also showed us, and I'm going to get in more detail of this in a minute, that God came before his job. I'll, I'll share a bit of this, and I'll get into it in my third point. My father never worked a Sunday um, at all. And he had a lot of opportunity. I'll talk in this in more detail in just a moment. But he never worked a Sunday. Now I want to I want to understand that there are some of you that are that you're at work right now. I know two people right now that are at work and they're watching because they can or they're listening. They, 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 and I'm not I, I'm not condemning you. That's not what I mean. My dad had this conviction about not working on Sunday, and he showed us that that conviction was paramount. Okay. And he, that, that came before his job. It came before money, really, more than anything else. He showed us that God comes before sports and activities. If it interrupted, now, teens get ready for this. If it interrupted Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, or Thursday night, it was a no. Now, keep in mind that I played baseball. We only practiced once a week, and we played once a week. That was it. And by the way, there was a different culture at that time. Everything revolved around church. There, there were, um, parents will get a kick out of this. There were no activities, no play rehearsals, no nothing on Wednesday nights at school. I went to Lebanon. There was nothing. The school was basically closed. There was nothing going on. It's not that way now, is it, Lily? There's, you know, there's, whether it's a, a dinner or an award ceremony or practices. and these, Those things just happen. But my point is, culture has changed a bit, but I just want to let you know where this was, and it was a little easier at that time uh, as well. But God came first. The other thing that he showed us, it wasn't what he said, is that every meal, no matter where we were, he prayed before that. My father always did that. Like Naomi, my father was someone who demonstrated his faith all the time. He didn't have to say it. My dad was actually not a man of many words at all. He couldn't get many words in with me and my siblings and, and my mother. So he had to show us because he there really wasn't a lot of time to talk. But he showed his faith to his family and to other people. I mean, I'll, I'll get into more detail in a minute about showing that. But the, not only do we need to show our faith, but the last point of the day is we need to share our faith with others. Sharing our faith brings anxiety to many Christians. When I tell you today, you should have seen the teens. I think it was Wednesday night when I said, how would you feel if I told you, okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to split up into groups and we're going to go knock on doors up and down the street and we're going to go tell people about Jesus. It was like, whoa, wait a minute now. It, it, there's, a, there's a level of anxiety. And by the way, that's probably with most, if not all Christians. There's this thing of like, okay, we're really going to go do this. It doesn't mean you're not going to, you don't like it. It just means that there's a, there's some butterflies in your stomach. There should be. But sharing our faith brings anxiety to many Christians. But as I have shared before, 
This doesn't have to be complicated or intimidating. And this is where I think this lifestyle evangelism of not just having lifestyle evangelism, but where showing and sharing come together, okay? And, and I'm going to demonstrate this the, the best that I can. When God guides your life, others will see it, and then you'll be compelled to share it. Let me read that to you again. If there's a key takeaway for today, this is it. When God guides your life, others will see it, and you'll be compelled to share it. Now, I'm going to go back to a similar illustration, but expound on it, expand on it if I could. Again, my father worked for General Motors for over 31 years. Uh, he retired when he had 31 in. He was in the union, and the union had some rules. Now, if you know anything about unions, you don't break the rules. Those are, those are unions, those are rules, and that's what you follow. One of those rules was in regards to overtime. At that time, the way it worked at General Motors was the senior person had to be asked if they wanted the overtime slots that were offered. You're, you're next in line. You, you get asked. That's the way it works. And it wasn't that, well, you worked overtime yesterday. We need to give somebody else a chance. Nope. If you're the senior person and you worked overtime yesterday, you get asked if you want to work it the next day. Um, Dad worked many double shifts and occasional Saturday, not many. Stayed over a few hours, went in early sometimes. We needed the money. What family doesn't? You know, what family can't use a little bit more money? He did receive time and a half for those. But according to the union contract at that time, I remember this like it was yesterday. He wanted us to know this. He told us this. Sundays were double time. That was part of the union contract. You got double time. So if you made, at that time, probably what was 20 bucks an hour, you got 40 for working Sunday. And you actually earned some more time off along with that. They really needed people. They worked 24-7. Almost every week, if not every week, Dad was asked to work Sundays. Keep in mind that this would have been life-changing money for our family. It would have been huge. You think of that. 40 bucks an hour, 8 hours, Multiply that times 4.33, and it's at that time, that's, gosh, 30 years ago now, life-changing money for a family. And again, I'm not, I'm, not this, I'm not condemning anybody who works on Sunday. I'm giving an illustration how Dad showed his faith to his family, but also to others, and then he shared it. Dad would show his faith to us as a family, his faith in God, but also to his co-workers by turning it down. He turned it down every week. They were required according to contract. He said his foreman would come up to him every Friday. Richard, <laughs> want to work Sunday? And he would just laugh. And Dad would be like, nope, I don't. And he was showing his faith. But oftentimes, they knew how tight Dad was on money and that he had his money budgeted out on two or three bucks a day to get to work and back. He drove 45 minutes and... Sometimes he'd go without lunch and these types of things. And they say, man, why don't you just pick up some overtime on Sundays? You'd have it made. But my dad would share his faith by telling them why. He would share with them, Sunday's the Lord's day. Sunday's the day that I give to God. And I go to church and I study my Bible. I teach Sunday school. And what it was is that showing went to sharing. Because of what he did, it translated into showing his faith to sharing his faith. Dad was able to share his faith with more people because of what he did. And they would ask him why and he would tell them. He never, in 31 years, he never compromised once. Not one time. This is why I tell you, this is the Naomi that I grew up with. So when you see me get stuck on something, sometimes it may seem weird to you and you look like, man, Pastor Doug really gets wound up about this or that or whatever. That's the, the, the display of faith and the sharing of faith and the non-compromised faith that I grew up with. There's just some, some things that I get stuck on were immovable. My dad was immovable on that. And so being convicted by that, he was there able to share his faith with so many people. Well, Naomi was not one to compromise at all. But here's what this leads to, and I'll wrap up and I'll close very quickly here, I promise. 
sharing out her faith and sharing it and speaking it and showing her faith, it allows faith to be duplicated. What my dad has done has been duplicated in me. Some of that has translated into my kids and some of that will be translated into my grandkids. Think on this is that here you got, um, you know, it starts out with Naomi and then the story we get into is you read through Ruth and you get into it, then you have King David. And some of this faith that Naomi displayed can be seen in King David's life. So the faith that that you boys and Izzy and Lily and all of us as parents and grandparents that we display will be shown into our kids, our grandkids, and maybe even our great-grandkids and for generations to come. It allows our faith to be duplicated. What we want, though, and what we see and what we count, if we will, is this immediate response. We see someone accept Christ right then, and that's good. There's some of that. But I'm finding we got to we got to understand more of this and what Naomi saw immediately with Ruth. But there's some things that she never did get to see. There's a delayed response, and it's maybe you sharing your faith with someone at work and being the Christian that we need to be. There may be an immediate response and someone accept Christ then, or it may be delayed. It could be years, a long time. But then the last thing is, we hope there's a lasting response that goes on for generations, you may never see the result. But as God convicts you about showing and sharing your faith, never, never compromise. Stay with it. You may never see the fruit in this particular time, but it will be there. It will absolutely be there. Well, back to the first point is that you have to know God. You have to have faith in God. My prayer is today that each and every one of us that are here today and are watching online that you know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. And if you don't, reach out to someone. You're online for a reason. You got connected somehow. Drop us a note, an email. Ask somebody in the room today in one of your groups, how can I know Christ as my personal Savior and Lord? Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Be with us now as we uh, divide up in a sense, if you will, that we go from this live portion to where our groups talk amongst one another. 